so good evening all of you and welcome to the final day of uh, lecture by dr nagma parvin as part of the covid week but before i introduce uh, today's speaker uh, myself and professor harish we want to place vote of thanks to all the people who have supported uh, to have this initiative on ground so first of all uh, let me thank professor vinod singh from chemistry so he was the one who approached uh, professor harish with the idea that we should have uh, a wider talk within the it kanpur community by experts who are working in this area and we all look for various uh, journals or news media article or whatsapp things for understanding questions which are quite obvious related to covid whereas we have among ourselves uh, such experts who are working day in and day out and know the real truths behind these things or they are trying to get that so it was wonderful to have all the speakers starting from uh, dr divendu dr amitabh dr vishal dr manind and dr nagma to be uh, so generous and uh, ready to share their insight and the research which is uh, still upcoming and uh, they explain things in quite detail and were very generous to answer a lot of queries which were uh, raised after the seminars to them and hopefully we'll, today also we'll have a lot of these questions to be answered uh, similarly there are uh, support from uh, professor abhay karandikar and professor s ganesh in organizing uh, this talk apart from that uh, i would like to thank professor nishant nayar and professor satyaki for helping out uh, with the logistic and webinar issues and mr sanjay from media sim uh, for helping us with the youtube platform uh, mrs chitrilekha from rnd for the poster and uh, support with the slides and anyone else that i might have missed and of course a wonderful audience who have posed very nicely all the questions for the benefit of both a wider audience and people who watch this on the youtube so some of these are available on the youtube and people can go and look at it so thank you very much uh, now it's time to introduce today's speaker so we have dr nagma Parveen, she joined last year uh, as faculty uh, in chemistry department at IIT Kanpur. She has her B.Sc. from University of Calcutta in chemistry and M.Sc. from IIT Madras. She has done her Ph.D. from University of Münster, Germany, and two postdoc, one from Chalmers University, Sweden, and one from University of Leuven, Belgium. So she has. Uh, lot of experience and uh, let's hear from her and um, any questions that you have please put it on the question answer box or raise your hand or put it on the chat box uh, i'll try to uh, unmute yourself uh, you know, one of one by one and then you can ask after the seminar all these questions to dr parvin so please go ahead thanks for the introduction uh so uh i will just start yeah so this is the outline of uh, the talk uh, so i think i did not write that i will talk about therapeutics also so i will also tell you about the therapeutics of the covid 19 okay so i will uh, start with the immune system so when um, our immune system is quite actually strong so whenever we are attacked by any um, any pathogen bacteria virus um, fungus yeast so uh, our immune system actually works very well to uh, either engulf them or to avoid them somehow so the system which works together is immune system and one part of the immune system is called innate immune system and skin mucosal layer 
acidic pH in our stomach, all are part of this innate immune system and some specialized cells that are called natural killer cells, okay? So like lymphocytes, macrophages, neutrophils. So here is a video. So if I start from the beginning, you see uh, these are uh, macrophages and when yeast, uh, which are pathogens, which comes in, these uh, cells can engulf them and send them to their lysozyme where they are broken up, they are like a chopped up. And then in this way, they kind of um, eats up, uh, if I say in a very layman language, uh, these uh, pathogens. But this, um, this innate immune systems working is very generic. So it can engulf any um, pathogen or any outer body, like which, our, which is not part of our body or which is not part of our uh, system that can be engulfed. And how this works, this unspecific engulfing works via this toll-like receptor. So in our plasma membrane and also inside our cells, we have these receptors, this, uh, this, this uh, Y-shaped receptors, and they can sense some uh, lipopeptides or liposaccharide, or you see this, this flagella, uh, these flagellas in, on a bacteria, and then they can um, engulf them. And also uh, they send a series of signal, as you can see here, and they see, send the signal to our uh, DNA to produce some special molecules. And these are called cytokines or chemokines, and they are actually nothing but inflammatory markers. So once we are invaded by some of these pathogens, these receptors job is to signal our body, our uh, DNA, to produce this inflammatory marker so that our immune system become more active. So in this way, they work. So this is a very simplified version I'm telling. So that is innate immune system. What about another part of the immune system that is adaptive immune system? So by now you all know about this uh, antibody. So this antibody is a protein, which is like this Y-shaped protein. And this has the constant part. It's, so it's written as C, a light chain and heavy chain. And this, the top of this antibody is the variable part. So light chain and heavy chain. And this part of this um, antibody Body is very important, this variable part here. There are specific amino acid sequence through which it, it can bind to antibody, uh, antigen. For example, uh, for um, SARS-CoV-2, we have the spike protein. So the spike protein is this one, let's say the amino acid sequence of the spike protein in here, and the antibody binds to like a lock and key model. It's kind of fit together. And each antibody is very specific to particular antigen. And this antibody's job is to neutralize any pathogen enters in our body. And who makes this antibody? Uh, we have a B cell and that B cell is a part of adaptive immune system that actually uh, neutralizes these uh, pathogens. And they are produced, they are generally on top of our B cells, like a, like a flagging out. Um, so our body produced this B cell and these are called naive B cell and the naive B cell then differentiate and then differentiate into two parts, the plasma B cell and plasma B cell's job is to release this antibody in our plasma. So you see they are called IgA and this is the first type of antibody when we produce. And then another very important cell is produced and that is called memory B cells and this we need because this, as the name says, memory B cell. So once these cells are produced, they stay with us for 50, 60 years. And the antibodies stay on its surface. And these antibodies are IgM and IgG. And this is their structure. So eventually, we want to produce IgM and IgG, preferentially IgG, because it can be uh, transferred from mothers to their newborn babies via placenta. Uh, so uh, well, this is uh, B cell's job. but. Uh, this innate and adaptive immune system, they do not work separately, they work together. And I did not mention about a very important uh, cell, which is the dendritic cell. So I will try to give an overall look how our immune system works. For example, when we get uh, infected by a virus or when we get a vaccine dose, for example, then uh, we have a special type of cell. These are called dendritic cell and their name is also antigen presenting cells. So what they do, they are part of our uh, innate immune system. So they take this virus, they engulf the virus, chop them up, and then um, they, they present some part of this virus on their surface. So that's why it's called antigen presenting cells, okay? And then we have some specialized cells that are called T cells, CD4 T cells. They are part of our adaptive immune system. They come up, 
they bind together and once they bind together they send some signal via cytokines and that tells our b cell which antibody to produce so i told you that b, uh, uh, b cells produce antibody but this is the mechanism how they make particular type of antibody against particular pathogen so this is very specific pathway this is one pathway and then as usual, as I said, that uh, then B cell produce IgM, IgG, and IgA. Another pathway is this antibody presenting cells are detected by CD8 T cells. This is another, so eight and here is four, okay? So this CD8 T cells are very special. They again go and bind to these antigen presenting cells and then they present a small part of the virus not the not the spike protein for example but a small peptide unit very small part of the virus so you can imagine like it is not only limited to large proteins of the virus but also small small peptides of the virus can be detected so then it uh, it presents the uh, on its surface the peptide and now this cd8 t cells can divide differentiate and form memory t cells and the peptide of this virus stay with us for at least 10 years or more. And there are also killing infected cells. So this, this tooth cells. So at the end, what we want from our immune system that we produce enough memory T cells, enough memory B cells, and good amount of antibody and preferentiary IgG. So generally, uh, when we are constantly evaded by some pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and our body actually works very well to do this job and keep these memories and make these antibodies and we produce them, these antibodies in our plasma that is called covalescent plasma. However, in case of SARS-CoV-2, it's uh, becoming very much difficult, and I will come to that, but how, let's see where actually the SARS-CoV-2 attacks. So SARS-CoV-2 actually infects our upper respiratory tract, that is this part, and then also lower respiratory tract. So in the upper respiratory tract, it attacks these cells, these olfactory cells. So that's why we lose our, many people, not everyone, lose their sense of smell and taste, and also it relates to the neuronal cases, which is more and more uh, becoming clear and in the in the lower respiratory tract it it infects in bronchi this kind of ciliated cell and most importantly in this alveolar so the the end of our um, in the end of our lungs where this alveolar sacs are there there there's this special cell it's called alveolar epithelial cell so this virus goes there replicate there exhaust the cells and the cells start to die that is how uh, our lungs start to dysfunction and uh, when when actually and how the replication happens so for example if a person get infected and get a symptom of fever or um, something like that that is we call zero it day and actually the viral infection has started uh, four or five days before so the virus has entered in our body and started to replicate four or five days before the symptoms come and then it peaks uh, about on the second or third day from the symptoms and then virus starts to the replication goes down because our antibody starts to produce so our immune system starts to fight fight against the virus and virus replication goes down within uh, within 15 days so this is a normal thing and i also must say that this data is from viral replication on this part and we don't know what happens in the lungs because the swab test is generally done from the from this upper respiratory tract and not the lower respiratory tract um, so what are the symptoms so far? So there are a majority of the people who are actually asymptotic, as we know, because they get infected, they have all this replication going on. However, they don't get any fever or any cough or any symptom. Um, mild patients, they, they have uh, some fever, fatigue and sore throat and other things, but they recover within this 15 days from symptom and moderate patient develop um, some pneumonia. So the, the infection goes in the lungs and our body is not capable to really uh, fight uh, in time and severe cases is goes bad, the pneumonia develops further and in tr critical cases, the respiratory system start to fail. However, as it is known that 80% of the cases uh, we see as and mild cases and we can recover at home um, but 15 percent of the cases there is a moderate to severe disease and five percent of cases reaches to the critical ill and some of them unfortunately succumb to death um, so actually the problem with SARS-CoV-2 is that uh, we still don't know how it is causing the disease. Um, the main reason is because there is no proper 
animal model for this virus. This virus is causing severe disease to, for example, hamster, but not to other animals. So it is becoming uh, very difficult for scientists to know how it attacks our lungs. So, but people have studied other coronaviruses like SARS and MARS and influenza. So from that, they can have an idea what is the possible mechanism at cellular level. So what happens? So this is our healthy lung. And at this end of this lung, we have this alveolar sac. Yeah? So the alveolar sac is nothing but air bag. And around the air bags, we have this blood vessel. And we have this epithelial cell, which I said about earlier. And these cells are important to transport this oxygen carbon dioxide, to diffuse the oxygen and carbon dioxide from the alveolar sac to this blood vessel, which is very important, right, for uh, functioning of lung. So generally what happens, uh, naturally, if we are healthy, this epithelial cells are forming and dying and it's a very regular manner 50 50 however when we get infected by these pathogen um, pathogens then the death of this alveolar cell is more uh, compared to how much they are uh, forming and that then our body uh, has to do something right so there is a second plan for the body so they start to make this this progenitor cells which transfer into uh, epithelial cells okay so there are some backup plan and these epithelial cells then can replenish whichever this 10 percent lacking however if the disease if the viral replication goes very high and there is more death to these cells then there is no enough time and there is a different type of progenitor cells which starts to form which is not like these alveolar cells you see it's quite different and they kind of form this barrier and they kind of clog this uh, alveolar uh, epithelial, this alveolar sac, and there is no exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide anymore possible. And then how the lung starts to become bad. And this is also why we are getting hypoxia. This is uh, SpO2 level is going down in the moderate to severe COVID patients. And then what we need is mechanical ventilation or external oxygen supply. So this is one type of uh, pathogenesis. Another very um, highly prevalent pathogenesis in COVID patient is uh, uh, formation of pneumonia. So this side, uh, the left side is the healthy, uh, healthy lung. So you see this alveolar sac and the um, blood vessel and they are separated. However, when uh, the infection really uh, is a high, then this epithelial, alveolar epithelial cell starts to die. And then this, this, uh, this barrier between them breaks down and the fluid from this blood vessel and other areas enter into our alveolar sac. Okay, and then starts to damage our uh, alveolar sacs and our lungs. Um, so uh, this is actually a bi uh, autopsy, a sample from a COVID, uh, COVID patient uh, who succumbed to death. And it was some area of the lungs where this uh, pneumonia has not happened. And you see, this is the alveolar sac area and this around it, the blood vessel going on and different cells are there. And, uh, and severe cases of pneumonia, you start to see uh, that uh, this, this, uh, this difference is gone. So all fluid, this all alveolar sac is filled of fluid. And this is how pneumonia is detected in, in a biopsy or autopsy samples. So this is how it's causing a severe disease. And that the third pathogenesis of COVID is lymphonia. So what is lymphonia? So I told you in the beginning that when we are attacked by, by any pathogen, our innate uh, or uh, our adaptive immune system works uh, against them and then produce these cytokines, right? And this is important to signal. However, if these cytokines are forming too much in our body, if there is a cytokine storm in our body, then it's it's becoming like a, a like autoimmune disease it's becoming like our body working against us and that is what also is seen in a covid patient from going from moderate to critical what you what they are observing in the in the clinical studies that these different markers the different cytokine markers interleukin and cabokine their concentration is highly increasing or their expression is highly increasing uh, in a, in a, um, in people who are diseased and who are in a critical conditions, uh, and that's why almost in last year August they have uh, they have come up uh, that it is better to treat a severe patient uh, not uh, for antivirals but uh, drugs which actually suppress these these markers. 
or which uh, suppresses our inflammation. Uh, and also what is becoming more clear that uh, in COVID patient, their memory T cells are actually lacking or the memory T cell against this virus is going down. So this is the healthy patient and then the non-ICU and ICU cells, you see the T cells counts are going down and also depending on the disease severity. So the hypothesis is the naive T cell, when it is a mild disease, it's, it's differentiating properly and making the memory T cells. However, if the disease is severe and the cytokine storm is too high, then the memory T cells are few producing and it's exhausted. The T cells production is exhausted. So together, uh, what happens uh, in the pre-symptotic or asymptotic case, mostly this virus is at attacking our upper respiratory tract. Um, in the symptotic and early phase of infection, it is already starting to infect our lower respiratory tract and that's why we are developing all the symptoms symptoms and uh, a very low level of pneumonia. However, in the moderate to severe, we are having a high level of pneumonia and the cytokine storm, which further relates to blood, blood clot. So all these three together is called causing this COVID-19 disease. Um, and it is increasingly clear that it is highly related with male sex because they are, uh, they are suffering from severe lymphonia, whereas women have a higher uh, CD4 and CD8 T cell activation. It is also uh, more prevalent in obesity um, because they have altered T cell differentiation and also a different difference uh, difference in interferon level, and also it is related to age, particularly older age. I don't know whether there is information about the kids or uh, newborn. Because as I said, our memory B cell lasts with us for 50, 60 years. So as we grow older, um, the, the, the memory B cell deteriorates and our immune system deteriorates. So it's also attacking more to the older, uh, older people. And also there is, a, uh, there is a European study, particularly in Spain, and where they saw that A blood group people are at higher risk compared to O blood group. And most importantly, it is associated with um, comorbid diseases like people with diabetes, heart disease, and I was trying to look at how these are related. So it was a bit difficult to find out, but what I found out that some people are saying that our pancreas, so people with diabetes, their pancreas do not function properly, particularly the beta cells of the pancreas. And this, uh, this beta cells actually expresses AC2, ACE2 receptor. This is the receptor for the virus. So virus binds to this receptor to enter into uh, cells and then start to replicate there. And this uh, pancreas uh, has a lot of ACE2 cells. So it is possible that the virus is also attacking our pancreas, infecting our pancreas and causing hyperglycemia on ketocytes. Uh, heart, heart, of course, because uh, this ACE2 uh, receptor uh, is a very important receptor for our body because this is our body part. They have a very important function. And the important function of this receptor is to control the blood pressure when our heart pumping the blood. Uh, so the, the, the blood pressure is important to control. And that is this enzyme job to transfer this in a, in a cyclic manner. And uh, then it is possible that the virus is directly infecting the heart and also so we already know that heart and lungs functioning are very synchronous, right? Because the, the oxygen uh, loaded blood is going to here. So they are very together working. And hence, if the lungs start to get infect and not properly function, the heart's uh, condition will go bad. So together, this comorbid condition is increasing, uh, uh, is making its more severe cases for COVID-19 patients. Uh, so how should we treat it? So the best or the, if someone think of the ideal way will be to target the virus, right? And how should we target the virus? Let's let's target how the virus is entering in our cells. So that is one way. And that's how this hydroxychloroquine came because it can interrupt, uh, it, it can uh, interrupt its uh, endocytosis process. However, um, uh, the, when, uh, so this is a, this is just a chart of, uh, COVID patient at standard care, and you see 130 people uh, reached to mortality out of 1,000. So these are number. And when they were treated uh, with hydroxychloroquine, the mortality actually went up, so plus 10. And mechanical ventilation went up. Uh, but when it is treated with a combination of azithromycin, it went down. But this gray data means there is not enough size of the sample of this clinical data. So we cannot really trust this data. So that's why hydroxychloroquine queen was dropped. Then another, uh, another thing which we can target for the virus, so the virus uh, 
has a different enzymes in it. So they are special to the virus so that virus can replicate. And one of them is protease. Um, and if we can target that, that will also help because then the virus cannot replicate anymore. And one of such, uh, actually two of such drug, drug is lopinavir and ritonavir, and they were actually uh, used, they're used drug for against the hepatitis C virus. However, this, this uh, drugs uh, which uh, works against this viral protease also did not not show good result in terms of mortality, mechanical ventilation going down, or uh, and also introduce adverse events, and also the sample size was low. And then third possibility is to uh, target the virus polymerase. This is a very important enzyme of the virus and particularly for a RNA virus. So I will not go into details. And this allows the virus to grow its RNA chain. Okay, so if we target this, if, we, if our drugs target this enzyme, then we can stop virus replication. So there is many drugs, uh, RNA, RNA dependent uh, drugs. And uh, one of them is Fapipiravir and Remedisivir. And they are used for uh, Ebola, influenza, and HCV. So Fabipiravir uh, shows a lowered mort mortality, mechanical ventilation, although some adverse event, but the sample size was small. Uh, the good thing is the Remedivis severe showed a good result in terms of lowering mortality and mechanical ventilation. And this, this green shows also, it, it has a quite a size uh, higher uh, amount of uh, clinical trials. Um, and so I will just list uh, the, the drugs which are used for the treatment or at least the data I got so far from the, from the published paper. So the standard care for a COVID patient is uh, giving antipyretic, that is paracetamol, mainly paracetamol and not ibuprofen actually, and detusive, that is palmocular and benadryl, so generally for throat sore what we use, antibiotics like doxycycline and multivitamins. So if, if someone gets a mild disease, uh, corticosteroid, uh, which is also commercially called butyrosinide, is used. This is an asthma drug in this dose. And the phase clinical trial was done with 146 uh, people. So you can see here uh, divided into groups, uh, control and butyrosinide. And you see if uh, the patient of mild disease are given butyrosinide early on, uh, their recovery is earlier and also in a higher percent. Uh, and also, it is only one clinical data, but many clinical such data has been done, and it shows a very green. So green means there are multiple data, so it's a strong data. Uh, then for moderate disease, remedisivir, which is an antiviral that is used uh, in this dose, and the, the clinical trials is quite a big size, 1,062 patients uh, in divided in control and uh, patient group. And you see um, uh, the remedisivir, if given to moderate patient, uh, early on, then the, the recovery chances are um, uh, higher and also earlier, slight, not really earlier, but uh, slightly higher. Um, and uh, the, the clinical trial data size is also quite good. And then for moderate to severe disease, and this is most difficult, and here uh, what is shown a good result is uh, glucocorticoid, dexamethasone, with this dose, and this size of the clinical trial is also quite big. And what they found out uh, that in this clinical trial, trial that among about 22.9 percent people in this uh, um, in the group trial group was uh, succumbed to death whereas in the control group with standard care uh, the mortality rate was slightly higher so here is the plot so you see the mortality rate is higher in usual care where with dexamethasone if given early on it goes down uh, so I just made a list because there are also few other drugs like uh, like ivermectin for mild diseases. Uh, then the the tocilizumab. This is an antibody against interleukin. So interleukin, you remember this is the the chemokine, uh, which is uh, this uh, chemokine storm we get. So um, so against them. And in case of this antibody against uh, IL six, this this drug actually do not improve the survival. But but it improve, reduce the mechanical ventilation time. So in general, if you look into this list, what we found out that uh, 
in this list majority of them are actually steroids or anti inflammatory drugs and not really antiviral only one antiviral sits on this list so this tell us that we are really not targeting the viral or viral replication but we are targeting all other things in our body to treat covid 19 and uh, if you are interested you can go this this uh, this paper which has actually um, collected 189 publications data and made this really nice chart and if you are interested you can look at different combination of drug has been used with different um, certainty and uh, different type of analysis they have done and they have just collected the data all the clinical trials data and made this chart Uh, i also want to tell uh, now a little bit about this other diseases which we are seeing now that is uh, this mucormycosis so um, and so covid patients severe covid covid patients are also getting this fungal disease so this is this is the fungus which actually infects the sinus and the brain and also another type one another type which infect the lungs um, and uh, this this uh, fungal infection is seen in severe severe cases severe patient severe covid patient and this is only is becoming surfacing in india and there are some reports which was in china but not in europe and us and interestingly what i found that in in pg imir uh, they published the mucormycosis was uh, associated with covid-19 cases early in january so they must have observed it last year and they have uh, told about that the, uh, the um, use of this glucocorticoid dexamethasone is possibly suppressing the Uh, inflammation in our body and then other pathogens are popping up and they can they can uh, they can take the advantage of lower immunity of our body and infect um so uh, that's a, that's a problem of this kind of steroidal drug that they 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 are not really targeting our virus the viral replication but our immune system and that's why other pathogens can take up and cause a severe diseases um but the good thing is uh, mucormycosis can be treated it has a drug uh, and this is this the drug amphoferritin c which is generally formed in liposomes and then given which breaks down the the uh, which makes pore actually takes out the sterol of the fungus and kills the fungus so it targets against the fungus so if it is diagnosed early on this can be treated but i want to tell you a little bit about new class of treatment and which maybe we should a little bit more focus on and that is antibody treatment uh, so this this is the uh, the spike protein part of the spike protein of the coronavirus and this is the antibody which is produced in our body when we are infected and many antibodies i'm showing just two so you see how they bind um, so people are now thinking to make this antibody or not thinking they already have done in a humanized mice um, and then Uh, collect this uh, antibody and then in the laboratory they could see that this um, this um, this combination of antibody can really neutralize sars cov 2 that means if they can be administered in in a, a patients they can treat because now this is targeting directly to the virus and neutralizing the virus so actually uh, roche the company uh, has already this this two uh, drug combination this two antibody drug combination in phase 2 clinical trials uh, and another company elilili uh, has a very similar type of antibody which they made uh, which is this are the name uh, and uh, these are already is used in emergency use in usa and these phase 3 clinical trial data show that um, 3% or so if the, the people with mild covid disease are treated with this drug combination antibody drug combination they have 3% of chances to admit uh, hospitalization in compared to a uh, control group where 10% of the people end up in hospitalization um okay so now i will move a little bit about the importance of uh, vaccine and how to design vaccine so this this paper is very nice and if you are interested please go and have a look here is the doi of this paper so here what they did they tracked uh, 188 covid patients uh, with mild to severe disease who are like recovered Uh, and they tracked them they did the kinetic study for 8 months and what they did they looked at the um, 
how much memory B cells they produced against the antibody, against the spike protein, different parts of the spike protein, including receptor binding domain, the nucleocapsid. Um, and then also they looked how much uh, memory T cells uh, they produce, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells. And when they looked in the first month, you see this black group, uh, they have all, they have the antibody, they have the B cells, they have the CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells and IgA. And you see after six months, the pink group is rising and the pink group lacks the CD4, uh, CD8 T cells. So they lack this eight minus. So uh, this is uh, what uh, what is the overall conclusion, but I will just, okay. I also wanted to say that we always talk about antibody against the spike protein. And that's true, that is we produce, of course, but we also produce antibody against nucleocapsid, okay? So we have many, many types of uh, nucleocapsid is also part of this virus. Uh, and uh, when we do this rapid antigen test, this nucleocapsid is used actually to detect uh, our, uh, whether we, we produce the antibody against this nucleocapsid. So this antibody, we also enough amount we produce when we get infected. Uh, so in this paper, what they followed, as I said, they did kinetic study. So what they found out, the, the antibody against the spike protein of the coronavirus uh, was slightly decaying over six months of time with a T half lifetime about 140 days. Whereas for nucleocapsid uh, IgG, the antibody against nucleocapsid was uh, having a lower lifetime about 68 days. And the memory B cells was intact for six months. So that's good that once if we are infected, it stays there for at least six months. However, they find that the CD4 T cells and CD4 T cells were uh, eight cells, both T cells were declining. So with the apparent uh, T half lifetime about 100 days. And this is bad because uh, if we compare, for example, if, if a, a person is infected by polio, uh, polio disease, a uh, polio virus, and they, they produce T cells which last for at least 10 years. So this lowering of T cells is not good. And possibly, I don't know whether this is the reason, but it is possibly indicating why we are getting reinfected because the T cells decline. Uh, okay, so now I think you got an idea that what should we look for when we make a vaccine, we should look for antibody, we should look for uh, the memory B cells and memory T cells, and of course their kinetics over time how they are changing, right? So this is a SARS-CoV-2 cartoon, and this is, I think you have seen it multiple times, uh, and this is a spike protein. Uh, so when, when we make a virus uh, vaccine candidate, there are many types, so the old school type is just to take exact same virus and inactivate the, the viral RNA and that can be done chemically. So then this, this, this uh, vaccine, this is a vaccine candidate, it cannot replicate, but it's there. It, it has all the proteins and it has the immunogenic property. So if it is administered in our body, then uh, our immune system will work against the, the spike, the, uh, the nucleocapsid, all the other viral protein, because it is something outside of our body, right? This is one candidate. Another candidate is not completely inactivate, but partially, and that is called live attenuated vaccine, very similar. And then another possibility is to just take the viral protein, in this case, the spike protein, or take a small part of the spike protein, like a recombinant uh, receptor binding domain of the spike protein. Another is virus-like particles. So just take a hollow virus. So there is no RNA inside at all. Um, another, which is a new class of vaccine, and that because of all this uh, COVID disease, we got this uh, first time, this kind of vaccine, and that is a vector-based vaccine. So in that, in this vector, so you take uh, external virus, another virus, in this case, it was adenovirus, uh, which acts as a vector. And in the, uh, in the DNA of this uh, virus, you put, uh, cut and paste this, uh, the gene of the spike protein this part so that once this virus goes in a body then it goes in our uh, in our cytoplasm and then release this this dna the spike gene and the spike protein is formed and then our immune system uh, make antibody against the spike protein so this is the idea uh, so one we can do the replication incompetent vector that means this this viral vector uh, the dna of the viral vector is uh, suppressed so it cannot replicate so it once goes there once it can deliver the spike gene only once and cannot keep on dividing or we can also make replication competent vector which can replicate and keep on making the spike gene in our body 
Um, another is uh, take another type of virus and put a spike protein on the virus surface. Uh, like a chimeric virus kind of thing. Uh, another is uh, instead of putting a vector directly take the DNA and put the spike gene on the DNA and deliver it. No, no vector around it. And another very, very novel class of vaccine and that is mRNA vaccine. So this is uh, RNA, um, which is a single stranded um, nucleobase chain and uh, cut paste the spike gene in this RNA and to protect the RNA because RNA is uh, it's really gets broken easily uh, cleaved by enzymes so you put in a liposome in a lipid vesicle um, so for uh, SARS-CoV-2 these these three has been um, actually working very well. And these three has been shown good result, these three types. So inactivated type, then vector type, and mRNA type. So you can see all three are replication incompetent. So once they go, they are just once go there and then deliver the protein, viral protein or viral DNA uh, or viral RNA. Uh, so that's why it needs a prime boost. So once it is gone there, then our immune system works against them and then just to make sure that it works uh, for longer term we give another boost so we get this prime boost uh, vaccine um, yeah and together with this vaccine we also get additional molecules which is called adjuvant so i will not get into details adjuvant are some additional molecule which are not directly immunogenic but they helps to trigger the immune system such as aluminium hydroxide certain types of lipids and certain type of small molecules like imidazoquinilin um, so generally when vaccines uh, are made, it takes a very, very long time. So you can see it takes about 15 years or so because it goes this linear process in the laboratory work, then a mouse or other type of uh, non-human work. And then it goes to the different clinical trials one by one. But in case of SARS-CoV-2, it was very rapid amplified as already we had an idea about this virus from the SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV um, epidemics and also the clinical trials were done not in a not in one by one but all together parallel it was going on so it took only one and a half years um, and uh, what generally is done in a vaccine clinical trial so in a vaccine clinical trial the trial is done in a random manner and double blinded so that who is giving the vaccine do not know what they are giving and also who is receiving and they do not know. Then we take a non-COVID enroll. So the person who is getting the vaccine should not have COVID throughout this trial. Uh, or they have to be dropped if they get the uh, COVID. Uh, and the placebo group gets either buffer or adjuvant solution. Uh, and the number, now this is a little bit has been critical. So the number goes from 300 to 50,000. So if it is in hundreds, then it's a phase one clinical trial. If it is in thousands, then it is phase two clinical trial. If it is in 10,000, then it's a phase three clinical trial. And of course they have to take um, what the age group, sex, ethnicity, body mass index, all these parameters into account and after uh, these clinical trials are done or during it is done what analysis is done that whether uh, the people who receive the vaccine is developing any disease or lung infection and of course most important that they have to look uh, how much antibody level is rising how much immune activation is happening like how much memory b cells and t cells are producing and what kind of adverse effects are happening uh, in uh, 28 days interval um so um the thing is how many types of um, vaccines are available so i started with this bharat biotech vaccine uh, so this bharat biotech vaccine name is this bbv152 and it is this old school type inactivated virus vaccine uh, and uh, it is in this dose and the prime boost interval is four weeks and the efficacy we still don't know as the critical third uh, phase three data is not out. And this virus was uh, isolated by NIV and ICMR. It is inactivated with probiolactin and it has an adjuvant, uh, algal or alum, alum uh, adjuvant. And the good thing is uh, the, the interim data show that the people who got the vaccination in their phase two data, and then they collected their plasma and the antibody, and they showed that the, the people who are vaccinated, their plasma can neutralize SARS-CoV-2. So in different time intervals. So they looked at 40 days interval, 56 days interval to the vaccination. So that's a good thing. And also the people got vaccinated. They have a 
a higher amount of uh, T cells production compared to control and pre-vaccination. Uh, and also recently they published that uh, the antibody produced in the vaccinated people in the plasma, uh, they can neutralize different strains of the virus. Like uh, this is the Indian strain and this is the UK strain. So that is also good. So it can act against different viruses. So it can stop reinfection. Uh, another type of uh, vaccine, which is uh, also interesting in Indian context, because we are getting this vaccine, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, and this is the name, and it is this vector-based vaccine. Um, and this vector is uh, adenovirus vector of chimpanzee, and it was isolated from chimpanzee Y25. Uh, so you have to uh, know that this is a virus, right? So this can also cause immunity in our body. And if we already have antibody against this, this uh, chimp uh, adenovirus, then it can never reach uh, to our target cell and deliver the spike gene, right? So that's, they have already tested. They saw that uh, UK population have 0% antibody against the viral vector and Gambia population have about 9%. Uh, and AstraZeneca also found out, so they did like two uh, big phase three clinical trials. So before they, the prime boost time was less than six weeks. And they showed if the prime boost, the interval, if they increase more than 12 weeks, uh, then the, the, the antibody titer uh, was increasing. The neutralization capacity of this antibody was increasing as you see here. But this is only true for age less than 55, not above because above age 55, it was not increasing and it also has a good cd4 cd8 t response and there was a two fatality only two fatality in in their uh, in their um, in their uh, trials and i also want to say that the efficacy as you see it is 80 percent efficacy uh, so this does not mean that uh, if 100 people are vaccinated 80 people are safe and 20 not no the, the the definition is this the definition is one minus attack rate with vaccine divided by attack rate with placebo and if you calculate so you put the point eight this side it will be so let's say if you take 100 people and do not vaccinate and let's say 20 people get um, moderate to severe disease and if you take another 100 people and vaccinate then only four people can get a moderate to severe disease so it drastically lowers down um, this this 80 uh, percent efficacy means um yeah and the the which is surfacing also recently now that this uh, astrazeneca vaccine um is not that good in neutralizing the uk variant the b117 and that is true it neutralizes the new type of so if we are getting this astrazeneca vaccine we produce the antibody the antibody uh, neutralizes the uk variant virus but with a less efficiency however it protects us um, just it's a little bit less that's um, so I just uh, tried to list all possible vaccines. So actually the first vaccine which was started was Syncovac Biotech Company in China, CoronaVac. And these are the details. Uh, and I, I don't know about its status anymore because I did not get much information on their phase three clinical data. And there are many other, uh, and they also have this, this uh, inactivated virus as a vaccine. Um, they also have different companies which are making different type of uh, vaccines. I did not look into the details. Then the Bharat Biotech, I already explained. Then AstraZeneca, which is vector based. Then comes the Gamlea Center, that is the Russian vaccine. Uh, Sputnik 5, okay, and Sputnik 5 is also same as or similar as AstraZeneca vaccine, only the vector is not chimp vector, it's a human vector and two types of human vector, one is 026 and 05, 026 is given in the first dose and 05 is given in the second dose, then Johnson Johnson or Janssen and that is also ambitious, they want to make single dose, and they also have similar as the Gamalaya Center's vaccine and they are phase three. I think it is already out. I, I did not look. Uh, but okay, I want to say the Sputnik 5 also has a very high efficacy, 90%. That means only out of one, one person may develop severe to, um, to uh, um, severe disease, moderate to severe disease. Um, then another class of vaccine, which is maybe not coming to India so soon, that is Moderna's vaccine, which is mRNA vac vaccine, and it has a very high efficacy, 94%. 
Then Pfizer BioNanotech vaccine that is also mRNA based vaccine and that is also 95% uh, efficacy. Uh, then uh, there is another company called Novavax. They are using the viral spike protein directly as a vaccine and I think their phase three is also out. I did not get the time to look into it. Then Zydus Cadilla, they are making this DNA vector based vaccine. This Premouse Biotech, they are making this virus like particle based vaccine. So there are many vaccine candidates are coming in. So in just on a lighter note, I thought I can give you also a list of this company and to just to get a background with these companies are from where because Moderna was established in USA and uh, a chemistry professor Robert Langer was involved in this company. Then AstraZeneca uh, is uh, drive, driven by Oxford Vaccine Group by Pollard and Gilbert. And so just I don't want to go through these, but what I mean, so you see many companies like Prema's Biotech and Zydus Scheduler, they are making new type of vaccine in India and uh, many companies are producing vaccines uh, in India. So they are not innovating, but they're producing the vaccine. So India has a major role in the vaccine program. So now come the final part that is uh, this mutation, uh, okay? So we are so much hearing about the SARS-CoV-2 mutation. So I just want to give a little bit of idea what is this mutation. So when this uh, SARS-CoV-2 came from China in uh, January early, we had this virus, D614. It looks like this, uh, and D is aspartic acid. So in the 600th position, 614th position of the amino acid sequence, there was aspartic acid. And over time, it just mutated and became glycine, D to G, only one position. And all over the world, now we have the G variant. We don't have D anymore. So you see how the demography has changed. Uh, and this G variant uh, is highly transmissive. So the number of outpatient has increased, inpatient has increased, and ICU number is also increased. Uh, and the mechanism why this uh, G variant is highly virulent is not because, so if you see the way the mutation has happened, it's not on the head, this receptor binding domain of the, of the virus, which everyone is talking, the head of the spike protein. No, it is somewhere in this conserved, in this, in this area, which actually allows the virus to fuse better or internalize better. Uh, so actually, that's why you see that how small change in the virus can change so much in their transmission. So it is important to know uh, the sequence of the viruses and to track them over time. So the repository was created uh, in GISAID. So please have a look. It's very, very nice repository. And you can see how much UK is contributing to this repository, a huge contribution. And in India, we are contributing by these organizations. So mutations, what happens that the one virus replicates and generally these RNA viruses they are very bad in replication because they don't have proof reading machinery so when they from like uh, from the parent to kids uh, or progeny, progeny virus, um, they, they are not identical. There is always some small change. And then some of them become somehow more pathogenic. They can survive better, they can infect better, and they become dominant. And that's how a, a mutation comes in. Uh, and then then become a strain, a new strain. Uh, so the variant of concern in this website uh, listed is, of course, D614G, which is now everywhere. So it is no more of topic to talk. Then uh, the UK variant, then the Brazil variant and South African variant, uh, California, there are many. And the Indian variant started with this B1617, but now it is established that B1617-2 is the variation of concern. Uh, and I want to just give you a look how less we are sequencing in India. So uh, this is just yesterday's data. So this is B UK variant, B117. And United Kingdom has found 200,000 of them. And India has 748 of them. And if you compare the Indian variant, also is similar, the number. Number of Indian variant and UK variant in India is very similar. And we are seeing this number because in India, we are just not sequencing enough because the sequences are coming mainly from um, West Bengal, uh, Gujarat, and Maharashtra. And very little sequencing is done. So we don't know which one is prevalent in India. Is this one or the UK one? 
So why also this UK variant on others are important, just to give a little bit of idea. So this is the UK variant and it has many mutation, but why people got more, um, more talking point because the receptor binding domain of this uh, spike protein of this virus, there was a small change here. So you see here, this red one was changed. So people started to think, okay, if it is changing, then how the virus infect will change and that will create a change in their transmission. Uh, the Brazil variant, uh, in addition to that, they had this part was changed here. And also same for the South African variant, this part was changed. And this part is important because antibody binds near there. So if these viruses come up and transmit, then the antibody which we have produced, they may not, they may not kind of uh, neutralize these viruses. So that's why uh, it became concern. And I did not get much data on the Indian variant, but a Cambridge group and uh, Indian group, they have now solved this structure of this variant. And they found also the, 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 the variation or the mutation comes in here, which is very close to the antibody binding part. And also there is, which is not shown, is P681 position, where, which is also important for the fusion of the virus. But okay, but what they find out that this, uh, this variant is not actually uh, is not uh, do, doing so much cellular entry compared to the Wuhan, the first variant, but uh, it is causing cell cell fusion. So possibly that is the reason that this uh, variant can be of concern or can cause more transmission. So it is still very, very uh, less information we know about. So that's why, because these variants are coming, now these all uh, vaccine companies are really pushing uh, to know whether their vaccine works against all these variants. And I think Pfizer, BioNanotech are leading in this regard um, because they, they have done many clinical trials and now they have shown that they are vaccine. So these are their data. Vaccine works against UK variant. And then this one is the Brazil variant, the neutralized. Um, but uh, the Washington, uh, sorry, this is Washington. Yeah, this is uh, B315. This is the South African variant, but the neutralization of the South African variant is a little bit less. Um, Bharat Biotech has also uh, gave an interim data that it neutralized the UK and also Indian variant. And AstraZeneca, uh, unfortunately, they are, um, they are the neutralization is a bit lower for UK and also for South African variant. However, the AstraZeneca has quite high efficiency efficacy in the vaccination. So together, I just want to tell that all these three type of vaccine which are available, they have quite a high efficacy. And now UK has released a very huge huge data uh, of their vaccinated people. So you see how large is the size of the vaccinated people and the first and second dose of the Pfizer vaccine and AstraZeneca vaccine. And they then they released the data and they showed that uh, people who got vaccinated, their chances of infection, reinfection or after vaccination is lowered by 60 to 70%. So yeah, so if you get a vaccine, that's better because the chances of uh, getting infection and uh, getting the disease is lowers drastically after vaccination. However, we also have to, um, we have to also careful because you, we, this is a virus very, can be, can be similar to the influenza virus, we can say. And influenza virus has a drug against it. It has a vaccine every year vaccine. And still so many uh, people die out of uh, influenza. And every year we need influenza shot. So we should not be complacent. And possibly we need uh, COVID vaccine every year, possibly if they, because of their mutation or because of many other reasons, uh, it could become like a, a flu, like an influenza vaccination. Uh, and also I want to stress that it is not only we have to should rely only on vaccination, but for example, I put the HIV data, for example, the HIV when the pandemic started, uh, so after the pandemic started, people started uh, developing uh, drugs and antiretroviral drugs. And as soon as the antiretroviral ART therapy started, you see people living with HIV has increased. So they, they were not 
they were they, they were dying the people with hiv was dying but as soon as the therapy starts and kicked off then the death rate has really decreased and people can live a decent life with also hiv infection so that's what i mean that we should develop antiviral uh, therapy for covid and uh, of course parallel to the vaccination and of course improve our uh, medical infrastructure uh, so with this i will finish and thanks for your kind attention Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parveen. I think that was an excellent and very comprehensive presentation. And uh, obviously, we have a lot of questions also. So uh, our first question, question is uh, from um, Mr. Gore. Uh, he's talking about your first, first uh, initial slides, like, uh, how many days it takes? Uh, you said that the virus attacks the old factory nerves. So yeah. how, many, how much time it typically takes for to get the senses back for smell and taste? Like what is the average? Uh, I don't know what uh, what is the time, but if I understand, if it is infecting first the upper respiratory tract and um, it will stay with us up until the infection, uh, until unless until unless it is clears up. So I guess two to two weeks at least. If it is, but if it is reaches to the severe or moderate disease, then it will replicate in the lower respiratory tract, and then possibly even for the severe patient after two weeks, it will go away. So yeah. I think possibly two weeks, but this is, I'm just speculating. I don't know exact number. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, what are the efficacy rates of our own vaccine, Covaxin and Covishield? Yeah, that I think I listed. I can actually keep it on so that it's easier. Uh, put the slide. Yeah. Uh, so for uh, Bharat Biotech, we don't know because for Bharat Biotech, the, the COVAX, uh, seen, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. COVAX that uh, has uh, no phase three clinical trial data yet published. It is ongoing. So we don't know the efficacy. Uh, we know the AstraZeneca's efficacy that is 80% if it is given above uh, eight weeks interval time. So uh, the next question is from uh, Ashwarya Knight. Can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, Are hello, you? hello, ma'am. Yeah, hello. Uh, the I actually wanted to ask two questions, but uh, probably the second one you have answered. So my yeah. first question is: What factors determine the gap between the doses of the vaccine? Yeah, so uh, the thing is, this this is again clinical trials, right? These are not fundamental studies. So it is very difficult to say in terms of fundamental studies, but I think this, this uh, science paper where they are uh, tracking uh, people who got um, uh, recovered and you saw that um, possibly uh, with, uh, with the time of generally after six months, the T cells are declining. So maybe if I can open the slide, you see there is a decline period. Yeah, so you see there is a decline period. So possibly somewhere in the half time one has to give or something like that, um, how, how they are deciding after uh, eight weeks or 12 weeks, it is, I think, uh, just from their intuition and from their uh, knowledge, these clinical trials are earlier knowledge. But I think uh, until unless people do the cellular studies or this kind of uh, animal model studies, then only they will know the reason behind what is working. You know? But possibly this is the reason, I think, the immune system, how the T cells are declining over time, depending on that, you decide where will be the ideal to give it and give a boost. Uh, and ma'am, as uh, the, all the three strategies that we are now using, that those are non-replicative, as you said. So would it not be a good idea to uh, use the adenovirus that is replicative instead? Uh, yeah. So I that we don't have to go for be... like vaccination in yeah, every... Yeah, I understand. The what one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't know... Uh... Because then you see with the viral vector is this also thing, although they are saying that people are not making antibody against the, the viral vector, but if it is start to replicate, uh, we, 
we may produce antibody against the vector also. Um, but you are right, possibly, because many vaccines we get, they are replicating, right? Or not, if not fully replicating, at least attenuated. That may also actually help. Uh, this is, I also think so. Okay, uh, the next question is uh, from Oswald. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, uh, thank you. So, um, is it not possible to innovate a medicine for COVID recovery rather than just managing with the immunization vaccine? Yeah, that's what I was talking, right? That uh, it, is, it is ideal that we should concentrate on um, designing a new class of treatment so that it can target the virus. For example, the antibody treatment, uh, which is now, for example, this, this, this two antibodies, which is already in phase two clinical trials. And also this is already in uh, uh, emergency authorization. So the antibody-based drugs might be possibly more uh, more direct in neutralizing the virus because other drugs for example the classical drugs uh, enzyme based drugs have not worked so far so but that i think we have to really do okay uh, my, my next question is from uh, why do the virus mutate and when does this mutation stop um, yeah, the virus, as I said, virus mutation is something not they, it is not they have brain and they deci decide let's mutate. It is just a random process and it's a, it's a evolutionary process, I think. Uh, and, and, and also like from parent to progeny, they can have different mistake. Actually, they are actually kind of a mistake, you can say. And some actually somehow survive in the host better and they start to persist. So it's a little bit evolutionary reason. Oh, and what about the Covishield properties? It seems that, you know, uh, the COVID, regarding Covishield, it was not mentioned in your slide. You know, can you please give no, an overview of that? The Covishield is actually the AstraZeneca vaccine. Oh, okay. Thank in India, you. we are calling it a Covishield, but it is, the name is this. This is the Covishield uh, vaccine. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So Thank this you, is, Yeah. So the next question is from Akshar, Akshar Mishra. Uh, Ma'am, is there any vaccine made till now which can treat all kinds of variants? Yeah, actually, that is an interesting question. I was reading just recently, so now they are trying to make a, a spike protein nanoparticle. So, and then take different receptor binding domain of or the or some part of the spike of different variants and combine in one nanoparticle. Okay, so that it will be like a kind of multi, multi vaccine, uh, multi targeting vaccine. So I think that may come up sometime. Okay, ma'am, uh, would it, uh, ma'am, would that, uh, ma'am, would the, ma'am, the technology you are talking of, would that be uh, also applicable if any other variant could be found uh, in the coming future? Yeah, if for example, because they are kind of cutting and pasting them together, right? So if they can find out new variant and they can possibly synthesize it faster but again the clinical trials has to go on and uh, I, I really don't know any existing ma'am any existing vaccine is not uh, is not that much sufficient to uh, you know cure all the viruses no, but uh, all see, the variants of the viruses no, but you see this Pfizer is very good right this is what I was talking about for example uh, yeah wait where is the slide so this Pfizer, they, they really showed uh, all major variants like UK, this is Brazil, and this is South Africa, slightly lower. Maybe they will now test for the Indian variant also. And uh, Pfizer can really neutralize all three. Uh, also a Bharat Biotech uh, vaccine, Covaxin, and also Astra, but with slightly lower efficacy. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Next, we have Satyaki. Satyaki, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> ma'am, you told we may uh, we may take vaccine every year is according to the T cell span and viral mutation. Then the vaccine has to reveal it every year. Uh, is it possible? I mean, is it feasible actually? Yeah, I don't know. That is like, but for flu shot, it is every year, right? So, yeah, that, but. I, I don't know. I'm just saying that it may become like an influenza virus and we may need to vaccinate at least for near future almost regularly. 
to them one question more. This is this is I don't know. I'm just saying it. Okay, so there is not no one no one has claimed this this will happen or something like that. Okay. Because then, these the clinical trials all are done very in in short time, right? They have data yes. only for six months. So until unless we wait for one year, then we see the vaccinated people still have memory B cell, memory T cell. Then we don't need. Then we will know. Okay, yes. we then don't need. So I think if we wait some time, then we will know it. Yes, ma'am. One more question: Why post corona diseases are happening? That is, after getting well, why a new problem arises for a corona patient? Yeah, this long COVID, right? So yes. yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know, but uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a difficult question. Maybe some of the viruses are not cleared as we are thinking. Maybe still they are there and then start to replicate again because we have not targeted them, right? So yes. most of the most of the drugs have targeted uh, our immune system. Uh, so if we have not cleared the viruses, and if, uh, for example, the patient have not made enough antibody against them, then we cannot clear all the virus. So they will be there with us for very long. And ma'am, one more question: uh, In the second mutant form, that is happening in India, so that may sometimes give corona test negative, uh, being positive. So no, no, no. Even even if it is uh, no, the PCR can detect even if it is mutated. So because it's only very some parts are getting mutated, not whole genome, and uh, PCR is checking the whole genome. So so it will be detected. Okay, okay thank you. It is not a quasi species. It's not becoming a new virus. It is the same virus. Only few parts are changing. Very few. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Dr. Saptarishi. Hello, Nagma. This is Saptarishi from ISA Bhopal. Hi. Hello. So, Hi. thanks for the nice talk. Just a quick question. Uh, what percentage of the Indian population do you think uh, needs to be vaccinated in order to attain herd immunity? Um, I don't know, but herd immunity is not related to vaccination. No, the reason I am asking is that after the second shot, mo huh. most of the cases in the US, they are saying that you don't need to wear the mask. So they are actually, what they're going the Spain or the Sweden model for the first wave when it started. Yeah. So do you think that by the end of this year, we can also go mask free? I At least like when 60% <laughs> when of the population yeah. is vaccinated. Yeah, I know it's a difficult call. Okay. Nice talk, Nagma. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know, but I think it is better to be masked because uh, you see these new variants are coming. And for example, even the Pfizer who are so pushing towards their vaccine drive, they, they are uh, vaccinated people having the antibody. They have lower neutralization for South African variant. So, mm -hmm. so you know, the one has to be maybe careful uh, because we still don't know about these variants and whether they can transmit again, infect and the vaccine may not work. Right. Thank you. So next is uh, Deepak Bomb. Yes. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, yeah. I want to ask that how many how many days a virus can uh, stay in our body? Uh, so yeah, the I think I showed one uh, one graph. So the virus replication cycle uh, on average mm -hmm. is about fifteen days from the symptoms start. Symptom starts. So uh, I think this slide, yeah. So you see, right? Yeah, yeah. So days. If everything works, so okay. if our immune system works, it will clear within 15 days. Okay, okay. So we, if, if someone is for positive with COVID 19, so after 21 days, we can assume that he is negative, he or she is negative. Yeah, should be. Thank you. Ideally, yes. Thank you. Uh, one question uh, which I'm reading from the chat box is uh, why ivermectin is given, which is actually antiparasitic, not like antiviral. No idea, actually. I also was thinking why they are giving. Uh, I think uh, when in Italy and uh, other countries and China, uh, when they were seeing this huge um, rush 
of COVID patients, uh, because these clinical trial data is on patients, right? Directly on the patients, uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the hospital. Uh, the data come from directly from the hospital. So uh, I don't know, means possibly the do doctors have decided to give the ivermectin and combination drug. Uh, that's actually good why they come up with ivermectin. I actually don't know. Right. So uh, there are recent reports that um, steroid therapy, so you mentioned corticosteroid as one of the major uh, drug used for treatment of COVID. And that has caused like a lot of these uh, fungal uh, problems like black fungus, white fungus. Yeah. Does yeah. it vary from the, are these fungal population ubiquitous? Uh, in both indoor and outdoor environments or like there are susceptible population only in certain geographical reason, reasons uh, of the country? No, no, but these fungus are everywhere. Like I think okay. it's just sitting on the table. I, I don't know. They are, they are very highly prevalent. Mm. Uh, but uh, so it is everywhere uh, around us. Um, but I think this, this you see this, this uh, in the PGIMR data, what they mm -hmm. show that possibly when they are giving this, this steroids, dexamethasone particularly, then this immune suppression is very high and this severe, uh, moderate to severe patients are, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Deepa? Vishal, Vishal. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, Vishal, yeah. So Dr. Vishal also said, right, also we are having this, um, uh, giving the, um, uh, the ventilation and then the water, is it the good water or is it distilled water? We don't know. And if it, as I said, it is everywhere. If it is in the water, and a patient is already immunocompromised, they are more susceptible. Uh, so how they are in the hospital uh, treating patient that also will introduce. And uh, this is a question from Dr. Ravindra. Can we kill virus in upper respiratory tract by any means? Like, uh, so then. Yeah, means you mean in the very early, uh, yes, yeah, in the first fact, few yeah, days. Uh, yeah, so if we have, that's why actually this, this uh, I think that is why it actually worked. I'm guessing it, I don't know. This antibody treatment, which was given for the mild patient. So maybe it has not reached to the lungs and it has not really started replicating in the lungs and only in the upper respiratory. So if it is given early on such kind of antibody-based drug or other drugs, antiviral drugs, uh, which targets the virus, then possibly it can be cleared faster. So. The problem with the SARS-CoV-2, the symptoms come only after four days of infection, actually. So you don't know. Maybe it already has passed on the lungs by then. So that is the problem. The symptom, for in, if you compare for influenza, it comes within two days of infection. So it's much better to, uh, better, easier to track influenza, whereas for CoV-2, it is salient for some time. Okay. Uh, there is one question from... Professor Vinod Singh, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Professor Singh. Yeah, Nagma, I just wanted to know whether alcoholic drink can help in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> yeah, why not? I don't know, but yeah, it is not in the standard uh, care or therapy, so... You cannot say. Okay, thank you. So, um, one like kind of very simple question is when um, you mentioned about cytochrome uh, uh, or storm, or yeah, cytokine oh, storm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's kind of you are uh, suppressing the immune system to control that. But yeah. then, uh, once we treat the patient, like the immune system may remain suppressed for quite some time. So, like we have fungal infection happening, the yeah. person is susceptible to other infections as well, right? Like that. Yes, so it's exactly. like uh, immunosuppressing. Yeah. Um, any kind of disease can also find, uh, like the patient may actually acquire. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. 
yeah so it is a little bit like people having that diabetes type 1 right we we our body is acting against us so it becomes a little bit like that that it's so much uh, immune uh, and we have a high immune risk, like too much cytokine that's why we have to treat the patient with uh, uh, anti inflammation drugs and then once it is too high dose or not adequate dose then it can uh, other pathogens can take up and then cause other diseases so is there a data available like how long it takes like on average people to recover and get the normal immune system if it is within 28 days recover then it is going good but if it is going downhill from 28 days then it's going to just be severe so that is kind of rule of thumb so if it is within 20 days if uh, the patient is not getting better that means it's just going to go downhill yeah uh mr sanjay chaudhary you can ask question please unmute yourself hello hello uh, ma'am actually i want to know how we can chemically inactivate the virus in vaccine in vaccine uh, yeah there is a slide in which uh, you can show the current uh, ah, okay. chemically inactive i understood what you say i understood uh how it is in inactivate right this propiolactone yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah this propiolactone is actually good question i have to look into so this pro propiolactone if you look at the structure um it's a it's this four membered ring structure and it can penetrate the viral membrane and as much i know that it actually somehow impairs the rna of the virus and how i i don't know the mechanism now but it it uh, impairs somehow uh, you you can look it is very well studied it it has been done for decades so you can little bit look how propiolactone mechanism works okay yeah so sorry i don't exactly know the mechanism but it works against the rna it kind of inactivates the rna so with that yeah uh, dr nagma parveen thank you very much for uh giving such informative talk and with that we also come to the end of this covid talk series uh, you can send uh, to me or professor harish like comments and suggestion for the future and i uh, wish for everyone safe and healthy times ahead thank you very much and have a good evening bye